Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Gross, for those of you guys who don't know me. I'm lead pastor here at the quarry, and it is a good morning for us to come together, to, to be together. Um, a special welcome to those of you who are here for the very first time. We are, we're going to stretch each other today, and so uh, before we get into this, I'm going to ask God to join us and uh, to be present with us today. So if you would, just bow your heads. Let's pray together. Gracious God, uh, God, thank you for this day, a reminder of your grace and your faithfulness, Lord. And we come into this day uh, in all different kinds of spiritual and emotional states, Lord. And you know right where we are, and I praise you that you meet us in that. And we ask you, God, today that you'd meet us right here, right now, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would move, you'd open up our hearts and our minds to hear your truth, who you are and who we are in you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, I don't know if you guys have seen this or not, uh, but the latest State Farm commercials, uh, I'm kind of a, a big fan. I think they do a great job. They give, they give this incredibly accurate, poignant snapshot of life. In one commercial, we see two very different events, life events happening simultaneously. One is of a father and a daughter, right? The dad hands the keys of the new car to the daughter, and she exclaims, Is this my car? This is ridiculous! And then the scene changes to a man approaching his car, but now it's stripped out. It's on blocks. And he laments, Is this my car? This is ridiculous! And then we switch back to the girl. This can't be happening! Her father pipes in, Oh, it's happening, sweetheart. And now back to the man in the stripped-out car. This can't be happening. And then a friendly bystander adds, Oh, it's happening, sweetheart. <laughs> and what a, what a crisp picture of life. I mean, for one person, life is, is full of joy and the promise of exciting new adventure. And for another, the world is imploding. It's unraveling with no answer as to why and, and dwindling hope that it will ever change. Someone once said that, that pain is a part, a constant part of life. You're either right in the middle of it, you're just coming out of it, or you're about to go into it. Pain's a constant in this life. And so my question for you, friends, is where are you in the cycle? Where are you? I mean, this life can be wonderful and exhilarating. But if you live a few years, you're, you're going to run into some difficult times. We don't have to look very far to, to see the tragedies and injustice happening around us. And, and while we're blessed in many ways in this, in this community and in our nation, I know many of us, many of you, have faced extremely difficult situations. Some of you are right in the middle today. And it's out of these seeming injustices that some of, biggest, some of life's biggest and hardest questions erupt. Questions like, like, why does pain exist? Why does God permit it? God, if, if you're so good, if you're so great, if you're so big, if you're so all-powerful, then why do you let these terrible things happen? Why, God? Now, I know uh, we're moving quickly today. We're, we're, we're getting pretty deep, pretty fast and sometimes we don't like to spend time there. We don't like to talk about the experiences, the events, the questions that cause us to struggle with trusting God. I mean, it can kind of feel like ripping the scab off of a wound to admit our doubts, to, to face those things that shake us. And that's true. But it's also how we grow when we walk into the wave rather than avoiding the wave. So wherever you are on this journey of trusting God, whether you're wrestling with stuff on the inside and not letting anybody know about it, I'm glad that you're here. Let me say up front that our God is, is big enough to handle our questions. He's loving enough to handle our emotions, even our anger our confusion, 
And he's good enough to meet us right where we are and to move us past that, to heal us from the inside out, to bring good even out of the most unthinkable things. Now, over the next few weeks, this is going to be a place where we ask and explore tough questions. Together, we're going to dig in and we're going to start some conversations and I hope explore what it can really look like to experience God, to encounter Him. Most of you know that we're going to be leveraging the movie The Shack to kind of spark our journey. How many of you guys have, have had a chance to see the movie? A few of you. Fantastic. Fantastic. I, I, I encourage you, and I don't do this often, but I encourage you to see the movie, not because the movie's perfect, not because it illustrates everything about our God, not because it's totally accurate, but because it stirs the heart. For those of you who haven't seen the movie, let me just give you a quick summary. So we're all on the same page. It's based on the New York Times best-selling novel of the same name. The shack takes us on this emotional roller coaster as a father embarks on a spiritual journey. After suffering a family tragedy, Mac Phillips, who's the main character, he's, he's the dad. He spirals into this deep depression, causing him to, to question his very foundation. Facing this crisis of faith, he receives a, a cryptic letter urging him to an abandoned shack deep in the Oregon wilderness. And despite his doubts, Mac journeys to the shack and encounters a mysterious trio led by a woman named Papa. Through the meeting, Mac discovers important truths that transform his understanding of, of tragedy, uh, of pain, and they, they change his life forever. In, in many ways, the shack is like a modern-day parable, similar to the stories that Jesus told to help people understand the truth that he was speaking. But in reality, the shack is one man's fictional, artistic, and imaginative representation of a deeply personal story, a story that explores how we deal with pain, how we find healing in the midst of hardship, and what it might be like to encounter God. Over the next four weeks, we're going to give a biblical voice to some of the difficult questions that come out of this movie. Questions like our question for today. Where is God when I needed him most? Where is God when I needed him most? H have you ever asked that question? Where are you, God? In all the mess. In, in, in all my pain, in, in, the, in the suffering, in the suffering of others. Are you there, God? It's a big question. And it deserves a thoughtful answer. Maybe you struggled with this question. Maybe you're in the middle of it right now. But this is a universal question. You're not alone. We all feel the weight of our broken world. Try as we might to protect ourselves, our, our families, our loved ones. Pain comes and we can't stop it. And then with the pain come the questions and our response to those questions. How do we find hope in our pain? And how do we know that God really is good when everything around us tells us that that's questionable? Now, I'm not promising that we're going to find the be-all answer in these next 30 minutes, but I know that God will meet us on this journey. He certainly has met me. There is, there is hope. There is good that overcomes evil. God is victorious, and He carries those who allow Him, who choose Him. Now, as we, as we begin, let me encourage you that God really can't can handle the questions that you have. Don't be afraid of the questions. You just can't leave them there. We have to engage Him. We don't have to hold back with our God. He understands our emotion. He knows our thoughts and feelings, whether we voice them or not. Our hurts are, are His hurts. He walks with us in the pain. If you have your Bible, and I encourage you to, to, to bring your Bibles, I'll, we'll certainly put the, the passages up on the screen. 
But here's the deal with your Bible. I, I want you guys to be able to access these passages. And when you go home, be able to turn back to them. And then when you have a friend who's wrestling with it, you're going to say, this isn't my stuff. Here you go. Here's, here's Scripture. You become students of God's Word. Open up with me to the book of Psalms. If you have like a paper Bible, it's like, like right in the middle. Psalms. We're going to look at Psalm 13 and then move to 22. This is a, a psalm or a, a song written by David, Israel's greatest king. As we read, you're going to pick up that he wasn't afraid to tell God exactly where he was at. Consider the, these examples. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How, how long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart, how long will my enemy triumph over me? Where are you, God? Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, and I find no rest where are you, God? You might recognize that, that second passage. This is one that Jesus used while he was on the cross as he cried out in anguish. He was, he was quoting David from the Hebrew Scriptures. How did God react to David's questioning? I mean, did God get angry at him for this honest Outburst. Did, did God strike David down? How dare you? How dare you question? You're not allowed to ask these questions. That wasn't how God responded. Not in the least. I mean, this, this is how God describes David much later in history. This is actually Acts 13, New Testament stuff. We read, after removing Saul, Saul was the first king of Israel. God made David their king. God testified concerning him. Here's what he says about David, the questioner. But I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. A man after my own heart. This is, this is kind of surprising if you know the full story of David. He made a few mistakes in his life. But David's relationship with God was marked by honesty and and God saw David's tendency to tell it like it is as, as his authentic search to know him. A man after his own heart. What an honoring description. David poured out his heart and emotions to God. He wasn't afraid to ask God the tough questions directly. And we don't have to be either. We don't have to be afraid. See, what we see in David's psalms and experience is that David unleashes his pain, his fears, his doubts. But he almost always comes back to cries of need and dependence on God. I mean, his rants turn into honest pleas for help and a humble expression of worship. This is so important for us to grasp. We need to catch this. See, David took his painful emotions to God. He didn't keep them in. He took them directly to the source. He went straight to God. And he allowed God to turn his despair into hope. He opened his heart, honestly, with everything that was inside it. And he let God work there to bring healing and to bring seeds of hope, even if David couldn't see his way out yet. David believed that God is all-sufficient when we need him most. God is all-sufficient when we need him most. But you see, in, in the midst of our pain, right, we often, and, and this is understandable, we get, we get lost in the why question, right? If, if God is so good, then, then why does so much evil and tragedy still exist? Or, or why do bad things happen to good people? Or, or why me? Or, or why my child? Or why cancer? Or why my friend? Legitimate questions. We don't want to gloss over it. 
And if we don't get to an answer today, I want you to know that, that we're, I, I'm available and our elders are available to sit and talk with you and to, to work through this stuff. This is where we go. For our time together this morning, let me just point out that the Bible gives us a framework for answering and understanding those questions. See, evil and suffering exist in this world because we, people, humanity, we choose it that way. We chose it from the very beginning, going all the way back to Adam and Eve, when that first couple chose to disobey God. They fell and took all of humanity with them. Without exception, sin has stained every one of us. It has stained our world. The perfect creation that God made was broken, and that brokenness continues. It affects everything. Everything. Does God care? Absolutely, He cares. Well, then why doesn't He fix it? He is. He is. But evidently, to preserve his prized creation, all of humanity, not just you, the fix is a journey. A journey in which he invites us to actually trust him. I mean, make, make no mistake, God will prevail in his time for his glory and for our gain. In the meantime, as he works to heal us, to connect us, maybe a better question for us to ask, better than why, is, is where? Where are you, God? I mean, in the mess of life, where are you? And the answer is right here. Right now. Right here. Right, right beside us and, and, and within us. God has promised to be with us always, even in the middle of our pain and our suffering. The author of Hebrews writes, God has said, never will I leave you. Never means never. Never will I forsake you. God is with us through the pain. Jesus promises to be with us through whatever we face. He wrote, surely I am with you to the very end of the age. And he also said, I, I will ask the Father and, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. I will not. This is, the words, this is the words of Jesus. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. God is with us through the pain. The evil and suffering of our world break God's heart. But until the day he makes everything new, he continues to stand by us, to, to carry us through. Does, does the pain go away? No. But he can, and he does redeem our pain. He wants to carry us through our pain to new healing. And as, as Romans 8.28 tells us, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. When we're hurting, it can be so easy for us to focus so much on the pain or the struggle that, that we actually lose sight of the where of God. It's like we experience a spiritual eclipse with, with a giant planet of hurt blocking out God's goodness. And if we continue to stare at that pain instead of working through it, we can burn the retinas of our soul and experience a profound blindness for God's hope. But if we turn our eyes back to God, back to Jesus, if we look to where he is through prayer, through, through community, through studying God's word, we can refocus on his promises and bring clarity to our vision. Confidence that the dark cloud of pain will pass and he will carry us beyond the darkness. Our God is faithful. He is all sufficient when we need him most. His arms are open wide. God is completely holy. He's completely righteous. And he is just. 
through Jesus, He extends to us grace upon grace. He is in the business of blowing up our assumptions and expectations and replacing them with an invitation to encounter His love and to allow Him to work in and through our lives. He is not hiding from us. He is pursuing us, protecting us from ultimate destruction. And He will stop at nothing to draw us closer and demonstrate His love to us. Do you believe that? I mean, do you believe that God is willing to do whatever it takes to reach and connect with you? I mean, it's one thing to believe this in a general sense that that God loves and that God is good, but it's another entirely to believe that God loves, that His love and goodness are personal, that they're for you. Throughout the movie, The Shack, Papa God the Father often uses this phrase, I'm especially fond of you. I'm especially fond of you. Do you you believe that God is fond of you? He is. I mean, more, more than you can imagine. Psalm 139 tells us that he knew us before we were even born. He knows everything about us now. We read that, that you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, and you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Our God knows you, and he still loves you. God loves you so much that he sent his one and only son to die for you. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. You see, what separates us from God, this, this thing called sin, it's not this cute little thing, this, this little hiccup without any real consequence that we just kind of, kind of shove underneath the rug. Sin, choosing, choosing self over God, causes absolute and complete separation from Him. God is holy. God is righteous and just. And His justice requires the penalty for sin. For death. And that penalty must be paid. And friends, understand the depth of God's love. Because while we were still sinners, while we were still in our mess, Jesus Jesus actually paid that penalty. He gave his life for our lives. Now, I don't know what that conversation was like. I don't even know if it was a conversation. But Jesus, in the midst of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, stepped forward and said, "I, I, I will pay. I will pay what they owe. I will make a way. If they want a way, I will provide that way. Friends, our God is good. Our God is great. Turn with me to to one other place in the Bible. I I want to look at the Old Testament. This is Deuteronomy. It's the fifth book of the Bible. We'll look at, at chapter 33. Starting in verse 26. Uh, here, Moses, one of the patriarchs of Israel, he was coming to the end of his life. And the great leader was addressing the children of Israel before they would go into the promised land of Cana. It had been Canaan, it had been a long journey for them. And here's what Moses declares about God He says, There is no one like the God of Jeshurun. Jeshurun's another name for Israel. Who rides across the heavens to help you and on the clouds in his majesty. The eternal God is your refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. The God of the beginning and the end is your refuge. The eternal God is your refuge. And underneath are the the everlasting arms. 
God is alive. He is all sufficient. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the one who was dead and is now alive forever. This is our God. And that word underneath, I mean, I, we, we kind of gloss over that, but, but let me help you understand what, what's being said here. Because it means the bottom, I mean, the very bottom. The root idea of that word is, is, is that it's a depressing or a humbling or a, or a beaten down. Like you can't go any further than that. It's been absolutely compressed. Underneath is the utmost limit of that which was beaten down. And so the question is, how far, how far down can your imagination take you? Or can the experiences of life, how far have they taken you? How, far, how far, far down does your pain go? The pain of yesterday. How profound are the sufferings of your illness? How intense is your experience of sorrow? How deep into sin have you sunk? This is what Moses teaches us. No matter how far down you go, you cannot go below his everlasting arms. They are underneath you. No matter how deep you go in the experience of sorrow, hurt, and anger, you will find his everlasting arms are underneath you. He will hold you. He is holding you, carrying you in the power of his arms. Regardless of the depth of your agony, we are reminded the infinite is underneath our load of grief and fear, terror, hurt, pain, and sorrow. The eternal God is underneath it all. And he will hold you. He is holding you. God will not let us go. No matter what difficulties we face in this world, God is all sufficient when we need him most. Consider his promises. Come near to God and, and he will come near to you. As a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you. And you will be comforted. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. These, these are the truths that we can cling to. These are the words that we can use to refocus our vision. God wants to carry us through whatever we face. Will you let him? Will you let him take your eyes off of the why and focus on the where? God is right here, right now. His arms underneath you. In the movie, Mac ends up at the shack because he accepts Papa's cryptic invitation he could never have guessed what he would find there. But he felt compelled to go. What journey is God calling you on today? What step is he calling you to take to meet him in whatever circumstances you're facing? How will you answer him? God is all sufficient when we need him the most. He's right here right now, even when our pain blinds us from that reality. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, that, that in your compassion and love, you, you meet us here. You, you carry us, God. Many of us, when we, when we take time to slow down, we recognize we, our hearts are filled with fear and with, with doubt and with pain. We're skeptical, we're angry, we're broken. God, we want to find you. We want to follow you. We want to hear you. We want to feel you. And so God, we ask together that you would meet us in a tangible way that you give us strength to turn our eyes away from ourselves and, and to turn to you, to look to you, God. 
Thank you that no matter what we face, you are with us. Your promises are true. You have been faithful. You will continue to be faithful, working for our good. Help us, God. Give us eyes to see you at work. We ask this in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. Amen and amen.